So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to start working on my shell code up on the screen. If you want to see the process I'm going through, try to get some hints. Uh, you're welcome to look at that. If you'd rather do it all on your own, keep working on your own stuff, just uh, avert your eyes and keep working on your own files. Okay, Corey. Yeah, I'm a bit uh, Linux tech center illiterate. I'm trying to use that Nano. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I should have told you guys that. Um, so in Nano, there's lots of text editors that use Linux, and people say VI or Max, blah blah blah. blah. Um, Nano is your easiest choice. Okay, there's nothing wrong with using Nano. I use Nano all the time. 
you just do like nano X file, it opens it up, and then you just do control X to save and exit. Control X, uh, control X, and X is in. So yeah, sorry, I, I didn't bring that up, guys. It's because you guys are a little bit ahead, and I haven't even thought about telling you how to use a test harness. But um, to use the test harness, <coughs> you do it like so. Um, let's say that you have your uh, your Perl script ready. So this is my Perl script that I made. You know, after making my shell code, this is just printing out the hex hex bytes. Now I want to test this out with the uh, the test harness to see if it actually works. So first, just make sure you compile the test harness with TCC, not GCC. And you can just do it like uh, like so. You can either run the script and output the uh, the contents, the output of the script to a file, you know, like a shellcode.bytes file, and then pass that to the shellcode harness, or you could just run the uh, script directly to the shellcode harness. The key here is use these backticks, which is the uh, substitution operator, which is basically just replace whatever, replace the, make the first line command line argument for this program, whatever the output of this program is. So you can also do like a, you know, let's say this is my shell code, just a bunch of knobs. Oh yeah, okay, so just hit the knobs and then eventually exit it, that's fine. Um, you could do it like so. You know, blog contains my shellcode opcodes, and I can just do backtick. Backtick is important, front tick won't work. Backtick is a substitution operator. So basically, just think that you're running shellcode harness, and the first command line argument needs to be all of the hexadecimal bytes of your shellcode, all the binary bytes of your shellcode. Is the shellcode harness that's just a C program that interprets the yeah, I'll show you what it does. It's really awful to look at. Do you ever see code like this in a project you are looking at for a sponsor? It should be uh, very smart. Because <laughs> basically, I'm using a uh, really nasty pointer arithmetic to change my return address. So I'm basically setting my own return address to um, the pointer to the first command line argument. Now uh, here's here's a tricky thing too. It's like okay, I'm gonna do my shellcode harness. All right. Hmm. Didn't appear to do anything. Well, that's just because I just executed my shell again, and the you know the prompt is exactly the same. So if you're unsure whether or not it's actually Running one trick you can do is just change to like the C shell, which has this you know nastier command prompt thing, and uh, then just run it again. And it's obvious that you can you've executed slash and the C shell. Not necessary, but you know just keep in mind if you're like, man, this should be working, but it's not working. It might be working. You just don't realize it. So we're, we're trying to take this and put it in the same place that we did the last text or so, right? In the uh, simple login code? Um, no. We're not going to use the shellcode here that you made here for the simple login program. We're going to use it on another program. Okay. But is your shellcode already working? I think so. You can. Okay. And if it runs in the harness, then. Right. But I mean, you know, I think I got all the zeros out of that. Did you try it in the shellcode harness? Yeah. Okay, and it worked. So yeah, because okay. it would fail on the harness too if there were zeros. This is my. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Okay. 
Who here has working shell code? Who does not? Who feels like they are close? Josh? I'm catching up. Okay. I'll get there. For those of you that have already got your shell code working, I will present to you your next challenge so you can start working on that. And um, if you go into the labs directory, slash home slash units slash labs, you will be execute, exploiting, excuse me, um, this program. So what's different about this is it's simpler than simple login, just to sort of simplify the exploitation process. Um, notice that the buffer overflow is happening on the command line argument. So you're going to have to pass your payload similar to how you do with the, uh, the shellcode harness with the back kicks and the cat. So like uh, dot slash basic bulm back kick cat payload uh, back kick. Um, not like with the uh, angle bracket operator. So do not do this. That won't work because it's not reading any data with like the uh, git call. All the data is coming in via the command line argument. So instead, you will have to be using your payload like that. So add that to your list of commands and make sure you're trying to use that one. And make sure you note to yourself that these are back kicks. Not, um, not front picks, not regular single quotes. But this is this would be the payload, including manipulating the registry and all that stuff. Yes. For those of you still working in your shell code, that's fairly okay. Uh, for those of you that are already done, I want you to start trying to exploit this and get this to um, run the shell code that you just developed. Okay, so you're going to have to go through the payload building process just like we did with the simple login. So your payload is going to need to be how many bytes total? 72. 64 bytes to consume the buffer, 4 for the safe rate pointer, and then 4 more for the return address. Inside that initial 64 bytes will need to be no ops and the shell code you just made. So you'll have to figure out how big is the shell code you just made. That way you know how many no ops to add as padding. And then you'll have to load up the program in the debugger and figure out where your shell code is and where your no ops are on the stack when you uh, insert the payload into your program. And then obviously set the return address to go that. Is there a certain place that you want us to unload it? Or just do you want it just so when some when we run that program, it'll execute the code instead yes. of whatever that is? Yeah. So one thing to be aware of, guys, is when you're working on these exploits, the stack addresses will vary slightly when you're debugging the program and when you're not debugging the program. So when you go to look for your payload in the debugger, when you just run it on the command line, the uh, values, the stack addresses will actually like shift around a little bit. It's kind of annoying. So the best way to combat that issue is to try to pick your return address in the very middle of your no ops. That gives you the most room on either side for error. Yeah, and there's no way to convert that. I didn't do this on purpose, it just wasn't cool. Yeah. I don't like UTT syntax, some people uh, like it. If you want to change it, uh, I, I would like it. <laughs> that would be good. Are you running as root or student? Student. Okay. I'll try. Um, and you can put it in. You put it in the beginning because GDB is ATT syntax by default. So if you add it to this uh, .gdb init file, it'll do that every time. 
it you know, it's just commands that run everything HTTP starts. So it is handy because uh, if you're like me, HTTP syntax is kind of hard to understand. So uh, I always prefer Intel syntax. Does the the option dump program has a, an option for listening in Intel format too? Okay. Yeah. Usually with you know. I'll jump. It's like uh, I'm looking at something simple enough where I don't really care as much. But where I'm debugging, I really like to see everything in Intel syntax. But some people, you know, they would crucify me for saying I don't like AT&T syntax. It's kind of like one of those Emacs or Emacs things, of which I prefer Emacs. I mean, tags is just so weird. Not not like tags. So just so everyone knows, um, I know I haven't really said this explicitly. The basic vulnerability that we are um, exploiting is just being able to copy an arbitrary amount of data into a fixed size buffer, so like an unbounded uh, memory move. Whenever you can do something like that, copy you know, a large amount of data into a buffer that's so small, um, you can often get arbitrary code execution by one means or another. And so, by and large, you know, buffer overflows are probably the greatest percentage of uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. There are other ones that we'll talk about. Some like use after free, the Aurora vulnerability was one of those. And uh, other stuff like that, but uh, basically, just being able to copy some too much data to one buffer is the source of most of the issues. In case it wasn't clear on, you know, where exactly the vulnerability was before. So, in the, um, for instance, in the simple login program, the vulnerability is. This gets call because gets will just read in as much data until it gets a null character or a, um, a new line, basically. And so there it is, unbounded uh, data copy. And with this one that you guys are looking at now, uh, it's a string copy. A string copy also has no limits, right? It's a safer version of this would be. Um, STRN copy, which gives, you know, provides some limits. But uh, that can have its problems as well. For those of you that chose the push method, one sort of nasty issue you run into is that uh, at the point where you begin pushing the string onto the stack, ESP is often pointed at your shellcode. So when you push the slash pen cell state string onto the stack, you'll actually be pushing data over your own code that's executing. And you'll get a crash then. It's really hard to debug because when you look at your shell code and the debugger, everything will look perfect. And not until your shell code starts executing, it's like polymorphic <coughs> and you know, crashes itself. So. Who else has gotten the basic goal that's for it? You guys got that? So there's a few of um, For those of you that are carrying through the uh, labs, I'm going to show you uh, something you should check out. So for Keith and the other guys that have gotten the, uh, the one excluded already, I would uh, challenge you to check out this um, like exploitation contest. That is pretty cool. Uh, there's a lot of like servers out there that do exploit contests, which is basically kind of like what you're doing now, and just kind of like more and more challenging versions of that. You know, you'll start at like level zero, which will be a basic stack overflow, and then by the time you get to level 20, you'll be doing some crazy, insane stuff to try to exploit something. And this is one of those games. Uh, OverTheWire.org is a pretty cool community, and um, personally, I think their games are the best and the most creative, so they're the ones that I recommend. And um, the one most relevant to you for getting started, if you like this kind of thing, is the Vortex game. So, um, you know, if you feel pretty comfortable with this material and you want to get better at it, uh, I think this is a great way to do it. Each one with the levels is challenging. 
and you'll learn a lot more about like bypassing exploit mitigation and stuff like that as part of playing the game. So yeah, go to overthewire.org, look at the Vortex game, it'll show you how to get started. And uh, yeah, I recommend checking that out if you like this stuff. Thank you. Does it walk you through the stuff if you get it stuck? Uh, there's an IRC channel, and okay. people are generally helpful there. Okay. So. But it doesn't have the solution for it? No, it does not. But the levels are very hard. Um, they start out not so bad, but they quickly get quite difficult. <clears throat> and a good place to like learn more about this kind of stuff, like exploitation material, is the uh, Frag magazine, for instance. There's a lot of you know underground magazines. Um, this is the one that I think is especially good. It's been on for a long time. A lot of the seminal. Uh, exploitation papers that come out in this magazine. And uh, it doesn't come out very often, and ironically, one just came out like a couple days ago. And they have all kinds of cool in depth uh, analysis of like exploitation and other stuff like that. So it's just a great place to get uh, extremely technical knowledge on uh, exploitation subjects. So um, Keith, for those of you that have already gotten the, uh, the basic vault exploited, I have a new challenge for you. That way you're not sitting there idly. You could be learning awesome exploitation material. And um, I'll challenge you to try to exploit this, which is fp underscore overwrite.c that you would need to compile with the CC. And uh, the problem here is that this is a off by one vulnerability where you can overwrite one byte past the bounds of the buffer, which means you can overwrite the least significant byte of the safe frame pointer, which is something that we have been up till now overwriting with EBBB. And just by changing that least significant byte, um, you can actually gain arbitrary code execution. Why, why just the least significant byte? Because um, you're just able to write one byte past this, which points at the least in the byte of the um, save the right pointer. I'm not going to make anyone else do that, by the way. That is pretty nasty. Um, but I do outline how it is done in my day two material, for those of you that are curious. And uh, the point I make in day two is that even the smallest bug like just being off by one can lead to a catastrophic failure of security. So the exercise would be to just overwrite that buffer by one byte? So the, the exercise is to get your shell code to execute. You get started on the off by one overflow, you can just try sending, you know, 257 bytes at it, and it'll probably crash, I think, and you can start looking at the crash, figure out why it crashed, and then why it crashed might tell you why it might be exploited by there it is. So one thing I haven't showed you guys that um, I should have is that when you're doing your payload and you discover that your return address isn't working and you just want to change the return address while having the whole payload. You can use a hex editor to easily change the return address. So, for instance, uh, you type hex edit payload. I can see that this right here is the return address you know, that I'm trying to change. And then just uh, change the bytes in here. So, if instead of F573, I wanted to put 88, I used to do 88. And then just do Control X to save and exit. X edit. So if all else fails, guys, if you feel like your shellcode isn't working, I did put up some shellcode in the dot answers directory. So if you want, you can just use the bin sh um, shell pl the dot answers directory, and that should definitely work.
So just to walk through that exploitation process, what I'm going to do is um, start exploiting the basic bone with the bin SH shell, shell code. And um, you know, if you're working at your own pace, feel free to just keep doing that. But if you feel kind of lost or confused, just follow what I'm doing. And uh, hopefully that will help clear some things up for you. Now the first thing I'm doing here, I'm just going to narrate this for like the remote users, for instance, is copying it into the um, into the labs directory where our basic goal is, just to keep everything in the same directory for organization. shell code which should work. I'm just going to put it into a file for myself. Four by buffer again, and let's see how big my uh, bin sh shell code is, just so I know how many no ops I need. 45. So, pretty big. So, I just have, um, what was that? Uh, 19 bytes of no ops, basically. Is that what you No, it's uh, yeah, 19. So let's start building my payload. First, add out everything with no ops. So first are the no ops. Then um, after I do concatenate the bin sh shell code on there, it should be 64 bytes total to completely consume that password buffer. Four extra bytes for that overwritten save array pointer. And now I need to know what my return address should be. So this is one of the trickier parts. So I'm going to open up basic bone in GDB. I'm going to set a breakpoint for after the screen copy because this is where the um, the payload enters into the process address space, the straight copy from that first command argument, that local buffer. So breakpoint for me plus 27. For, for this uh, program, I have to use the backticks, backtick cat payloads, backtick substitution operator. Okay, so I hit the breakpoint. At this point, I want to scan the stack for my payload so I know what to use my return address. Okay, and I can see my no ops are in here, starting at OXBF, FF, F518, you know, these OX90s. Uh, up to F20, and uh, just like I was telling you guys, I want to pick somewhere in the middle of the no ops to give myself enough wiggle room. So I'm just going to do BF, FF, um, I'm avoiding this address for a reason. Can anyone tell me why I don't want to use this address? Out of curiosity? That's a really hard question, I want to tell you. Because uh, OX20, which I would have to write is actually the um, hexadecimal code for the space operator. And that could cause some problems. This is going on the command line argument. So instead, I'm going to do OXBFFF 
F519. So, so OXPF, FF, F5, F5, 1, F should be in the middle of my no ops, so that's what I'm going to use for my return address. Doing it backwards because we're in a little Indian world. So there's my payload. Up to this point is 64 bytes. That's what's going to consume that password buffer we're overflowing. Save frame pointer. Doesn't matter. Overriding it. Return address, which points to the middle of my no-ops. Should be pointing like at uh, this byte right here, basically. All right, now we cross our fingers and run it and see what happens. Oh no. These things happen. And it's good that this happened actually because I can show you how to debug the scenario. So, um, like I sort of uh, have hinted at before, the addresses can be a little bit different in the debugger than they are when you run on the command line. And that's just because the stack shifts around when you're debugging things with GDB compared to if you're running on the command line. So, luckily, Linux has some functionality where if it if we enable it, um, when a process crashes, it will dump a, a core image, like basically an image of the process that it was running. And then I can use that uh, crash dump to see what the process was doing at the time it crashed. And it will help me see, uh, give me a, a better picture of what the memory was uh, during the crash. And then I can see how my addresses were off and what went wrong. So let's do that now. So here's a command to write down, guys. You limit. Unlimited. This command will cause uh, Linux to dump these core images every time a process sick falls. It's important when you're exploiting things and you have all kinds of crashes during your payload development process. And if I do that command and then um, run it again, you'll see the, uh, the brackets core dump, which is telling me the core file exists now. And here's another command for you guys to write down. Uh, to use that core file, do gdb basic vuln as the core. Put it in for that second command line argument, add in a core, which is just telling it to use the core file, which is the, uh, the dump of the process's image image the time that it crashed. The dump of the process's memory, excuse me. Okay. So this gives me some useful information. First of all, I crashed on this, OXBFFF522, which is a stack address, right? So um, I probably just jumped into the middle of my shell code or something like that. And um, Dave and company have already seen this one because their shell code is getting clobbered by push instructions. Um, so at this point, what I would want to do is inspect the memory of this address and see what I'm trying to execute here. And it should give you some insight into what's going on. Okay. So it looks like um, I guessed the wrong address and I didn't even jump into my shell code. It looks like I, you know. Jumped into there somewhere, somewhere above my shell code. So uh, let's hit enter again, which will let me look a little, little bit further. And that right there should be my uh, my shell code starting in root three b. So what I'm going to do is just uh, pick another address, try to get lucky again. 
So this time I'm going to pick um, BFFF537. So I'm just going to use the hex editor to go and change that address. because it shows you exactly what the uh, process address space looked like at the time of that crash. That way if your addresses are a little bit off, that will reveal, you know, that will be revealed when you look at the core image. Okay, so out of curiosity, um, do you guys want me to let you spend more time on this? Would you rather me go ahead and move forward with other material? It's completely up to you. Press ahead. Go ahead. Press ahead. Yeah. Okay. You can do that. 